Would Russia attack and invade the Baltics? And could America's military stop them? Closing parenthesis. Dot, the current NATO force structure in Eastern Europe would be unable to withstand a Russian invasion. Into neighboring Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia a new think tank study has concluded. After conducting an exhaustive series of war games wherein red, Russian and blue NATO forces engaged in a wide range of war scenarios over the Baltic states, a RAND Corporation study called Reinforcing Deterrence on NATO's Eastern Flank determined that a successful NATO defense of the region would require a much larger air ground force than what is currently deployed. In particular, the study calls for a NATO strategy similar to the Cold War era's airland battle doctrine from the 1980s. During this time, the U.S. Army stationed at least several hundred thousand troops in Europe as a strategy to deter a potential Russian invasion. Officials with U.S. Army Europe tell Scout Warrior that there are currently 30,000 U.S. Army soldiers in Europe. The RAND study maintains that Without a deterrent the size of at least seven brigades, fires and air support protecting Eastern Europe, the Russia cold overrun the Baltic states as quickly as in 60 hours. As currently postured NATO cannot successfully defend the territory of its most exposed members. Across multiple games using a wide range of expert participants in and out of uniform playing both sides. The longest it has taken Russian forces to reach the outskirts of the Estonian and or Latvian capitals of Talon and Riga respectively is 60 hours. Such a rapid defeat would leave NATO with a limited number of options, the study writes. This first appeared in Scout Warrior here. Airland battle was a strategic warfighting concept followed by U.S. and Allied forces during the Cold War which, among other things, relied upon precise coordination between a large maneuvering mechanized ground force and attack. Aircraft overhead, as part of the approach. Air attacks would seek to weaken enemy assets supporting frontline enemy troops by bombing supply elements in the rear. As part of the air ground integration, large conventional ground forces could then more easily advance through defended enemy frontline areas. A rapid assault on the Baltic region would leave NATO with few attractive options, including a massive risky counterattack. Threatening a nuclear weapons option or simply allowing the Russian to annex the countries. One of the limited options cited in the study could include taking huge amounts of time to mobilize and deploy a massive counterattack force which would likely result in a drawn-out, deadly battle. Another possibility would be to threaten a nuclear option, a scenario which seems unlikely if not completely unrealistic in light of the U.S. strategy to decrease nuclear arsenals and discourage the prospect of using nuclear weapons. The study finds a third and final option. The report mentions, would simply be to concede the Baltic states and immerse the alliance into a much more intense cold war posture. Such an option would naturally not be welcomed by many of the residents of these states and would, without question, leave the NATO alliance weakened if not partially fractured. The study spells out exactly what its war games determined would be necessary as a credible, effective deterrent. Gaming indicates that a force of about seven brigades including three heavy armored brigades adequately supported by air power, land-based fires, and other enablers on the ground and ready to fight at the onset of hostilities, could suffice to prevent the rapid overrun of the Baltic states, the study writes. During the various scenarios explored for the war game, its participants concluded that NATO resistance would be overrun quickly in the absence of a larger mechanized defensive force posture, the absence of short-range air defenses in the U.S. units, and the minimal defenses in the other NATO units, meant that many of these attacks encountered resistance only from NATO combat air patrols, which were overwhelmed by sheer numbers. The result was heavy losses to several blue NATO battalions and the disruption of the counterattack. The study states, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia could be likely Russian targets because all three countries are in close proximity to Russia and spent many years as part of the former Soviet Union also like Ukraine. Estonia and Latvia are home to sizable ethnic Russian populations that have been at best unevenly integrated into the two countries post-independence political and social mainstreams and that give Russia a self-justification for meddling in Estonian and Latvian affairs. The study explains 
while the Pentagon's European Reassurance Initiative calls for additional funds, forces and force rotations through Europe in coming years. It is unclear whether their ultimate troop increases will come anywhere near what Rand recommends. Pentagon officials would not, at the moment, speculate as to whether thoughts and considerations were being given to raising forces levels beyond what is called for in the initiative. At the same time, the Pentagon's $3.4 billionary request does call for an increased force presence in Europe as well as fires, pre-positioned stocks and headquarters support for NATO forces. Officials with U.S. Army Europe tell Scout Warrior that more solidarity exercises with NATO allies in Europe are also on the horizon and that more manpower could also be on the way. We are currently planning the future rotations of units through Europe. The heel-to-toe concept will increase how often they're here for the armored BCT mission. But it won't increase how many are here at once that will remain just one at a time. We currently have some aviation assets on a rotation here but plans aren't yet firm on what that looks like going forward. We've requested additional funding for National Guard and Reserve manpower which may come in the form of full or partial units or even individuals. Kathy Brown van der Marl, spokeswoman for you. Yes, Army Europe told Scout Warrior in a statement. Increased solidarity exercises would be designed to further deter Russia by showing allies cooperation along with an ability to quickly deploy and move mechanized forces across the European continent. Van der Marl added, the RAND study maintains that, while expensive, adding brigades would be a worthy effort for NATO. Buying three brand new ABCTs and adding them to the U. S. Army would not be inexpensive, the upfront costs for all the equipment for the brigades and associated artillery, air defense and other enabling units runs on the order of 13 billion dollars. However, much of that gear, especially the expensive Abrams tanks and Bradley fighting vehicles already exists, the study says. The Russian military rushes military maneuvers and annexation of the Crimean Peninsula have Many Pentagon analysts likely wondering about and assessing the relative condition of the former Cold War military giants' forces, platforms and weaponry. Russia has clearly postured itself in response to NATO as though it can counterbalance a deter. The alliance, however expert examination of Russia's current military reveals it is not likely to pose a real challenge to NATO in a prolonged all-out military engagement. Russia's economic pressures have not slowed the country's commitment to rapid military modernization and the increase of defense budgets. Despite the fact that the country's military is a fraction of what it was during the height of the Cold War in the 1980s, while the former Cold War giants' territories and outermost borders are sizably less than they were in the 1980s, Russia's conventional land, air and sea forces are trying to expand quickly, transition into the higher tech information age and steadily pursue next generation platforms. Russia's conventional and nuclear arsenal is a small piece of what it was during the Cold War. However, the country is pursuing a new class of air independent submarines, a T-50 stealth fighter jet, next generation missiles and high-tech gear for individual ground soldiers. During the Cold War, the Russian defense budget amounted to nearly half of the country's overall expenditures. Analysts have said. Now, the country's military spending draws upon a smaller percentage of its national expenditure. However, despite these huge percentage differences compared to the 1980s, the Russian defense budget is climbing again. From 2006 to 2009, the Russian defense budget jumped from $25 billion up to $50 billion according to Business Insider. And the 2013 defense budget is listed elsewhere at $90 billion. Overall. The Russian conventional military during the Cold War in terms of sheer size was likely five times what it is today. Overall, the Russian military had roughly 766,000 active frontline personnel in 2013 and as many as two, four million reserve forces according to Global Firepower. Com. During the Cold War the Russian army had as many as three to four million members. By the same 2013 assessment. The Russian military is listed as having more than 3,000 aircraft and 973 helicopters. On the ground global firepower. Com says Russia has 15,000 tanks, 27,000 armored fighting vehicles and nearly 6,000 self-propelled guns for artillery. 
while the Russian military may not have a conventional force the sheer size of its Cold War force. They have made efforts to both modernize and maintain portions of the mechanized weaponry and platforms. The Russian T-72 tank, for example, has been upgraded numerous times since its initial construction in the 1970s. Analysts have also said that the Russian military made huge amounts of conventional and nuclear weapons in the 80s, ranging from rockets and cruise missiles to very effective air defenses. In fact, the Russian built S-300 and S-400 anti-aircraft air defenses, if maintained and modernized, are said to be particularly effective, experts have said. In the air, the Russian have maintained the 1980s built Su-27 fighter jets, which have been postured throughout the region by the Russian military, often compared to the U.S. Air Force's F-15 Eagle fighter. The Su-27 is a maneuverable twin-engine fighter built in the 1980s and primarily configured for air superiority missions. While many experts maintain that NATO's size, firepower, air supremacy and technology would ultimately prevail in a substantial engagement with Russia, that does not necessarily negate the RAND study's findings that NATO would be put in a terrible predicament should Russia invade the Baltic states. Chris Osborne became the managing editor of Scout Warrior in August of 2015.